you'd like to go ahead and have our young children go on to Children's Church this morning, go ahead and get them ready to do that. And uh, so glad for Brother David and Sister Rhonda. Give them a hand this morning helping us with the children. So thankful for their willingness to help us to make that possible. Man, I realize this was one of the harder ministries to fulfill in a church is a uh, children's ministry, and they've been faithful to that for many years and commend them for that. So, so thankful. Such a beautiful crowd. Glad to see in God's house, as I mentioned earlier. If you've slipped in in the last little bit since we made our original announcements, I want you to make sure you're at home. I want you to know you're welcome at Gray Street Church of God. This is not a celebrity church. Uh, you know, I, not in the regards that we're big time or anything like that, but we're big time in the eyes of God, amen, because we're his children and uh, we're just a family. I often try to remind the church that, uh, that just like any family, that one of the greatest things that you can have within a church is a family. And uh, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. A lot of times people say, why do people call her sister Myers and brother Myers, you know what I mean? And it's because we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're of one kin. We're, we're saved. We're washed in the blood. And uh, we're God's children. Therefore, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. doesn't matter what background you came from. You could have been rich, could have been poor, could have been skinny, could have been large. You could have been anything. And I'm glad that we can be saved and we can be set for us. Sister Myers, oh, Lord, i got to get on her. She'll be over there talking about big, large, and all that. Watch and see. But anyway. But I love us. I love what God's doing in us, and uh, and we've been blessed in many ways. How about we look into God's Word, see what He has to say to us on this beautiful day? Luke chapter number eleven, and we're going to turn to verse number five. Luke chapter number eleven, verse number five. See, I've been living my wife long enough. I know what she was thinking. I'm glad He loved me enough. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. She's something else. you got an awesome pastor's wife, I'll tell you that. And as I mentioned earlier, it's such a privilege to have my mom and dad with me this morning. Give them a hand. Let them know. Appreciate them being here. If you're visiting today, thank you for being here today at Gray Street. It is our honor to have you with us today. Today doesn't have to be your one and only time. You can come and be a part of this family, and I'll do my best to be a good pastor, and she will be a good pastor's wife best we can to you. Luke chapter 11, verse number 5. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right. I want you to listen very closely to the text here. I want you to read it as we follow along here and pay attention to what the words actually say. The Bible said here, He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in the bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, Yet because of his importunity, some of you don't know what the word importunity means. That's okay. Sometimes we have to look these words up. That means his persistence. But because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. In other words, I better give this guy some bread and get him on his way so I can go back to sleep. Amen. He says in verse number 9, And I say unto you, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, what's it going to do? It's going to be open. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? How many is going to help me preach a little while this morning? It's time to go to work, ain't it? 
I'm going to preach a little while this morning on the desperation of a midnight need. Ask, you, ask the Lord with me to help us in this service this morning. Father, we love you for the word of God's sake. We thank you for the spirit of God. We ask you to speak to this congregation that is before me. Let the word permeate our hearts and saturate our spirit. Let us receive the engrafted word of God and we'll give you praise for every good thing that is accomplished. We'll thank you for everything that is done in this service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray all this and everyone can say amen. Amen. Somebody, look at somebody close to you and tell them sometimes things get desperate, desperate right around midnight. Amen. I'm going to preach a little while this morning on the desperation of a midnight need. Anybody ever had a desperate need before? I want to try to just recap the story just to make sure that we don't lose the continuity of the text and, and fail in the regard of helping you have clarity of understanding here. But the Bible begins to show us and paint a picture where that Jesus gives us a parable, if you will, of an event to show us several things for our everyday life. Anytime you see the Lord is giving a parable, it is for the purpose of our own uh, help and our own strength and our own wisdom and our own knowledge to live from day to day. But in this particular parable, what we began to see is you see three different individuals, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but we see three different individuals in this story. First of all, you've got this one fella. He is uh, what I'm going to call the traveler. He is the traveling friend. He's the one that's been traveling all night long, most likely, maybe all day long. And apparently, and it's obvious in my opinion from the text, this man is desperate. I'm thinking this man must have arrived on the doorstep of a friend in such a desperate need that he arrived lethargic. If they would have had an emergency room in that day, they would have probably gave him a bag of IV uh, uh, fluids and they would have probably checked his blood level and they would have probably admitted him for the night and let him get resuscitated and revived. But he arrives probably beaten and broken from the long travel. And when he arrives on the doorstep of his friend, his friend realizes that his friend is in bad shape. Maybe he had water, but the one thing that he did not have, he did not have bread. He didn't have bread to help his friend to be revived. How many of you know that food and nourishment can help us to regain strength to be able to be revived? And so that bread that he needed, he did not have. For his friend, if you think in your mind this morning that it is midnight in their day, they didn't have Publix or Kroger's, they didn't have Aldi or any other grocery store or convenience store, they didn't even have a Dollar General store, folk. I'm going to tell you, it was bad. Now, you know, so you got a Dollar General store in every city block anymore. I think they're going to put one on the moon. But anyway, they didn't have any of that. In that day, so the, the so this friend cannot just go anywhere and get what he needs to be able to supply what his friend needs. He may not have even had the money to supply what his friend need, but nevertheless, he takes it upon himself to go to another friend's house. And I'm assuming he may have been a neighbor. I don't know how far he had to travel, but in this parable, he gets to the other friend's house. And as he gets to the other friend's house, he begins to knock upon the door. The, he, as he knocks on that door, the man that is in the inside of that house, who is his friend, is laying in the bed. It's midnight. He has already gone to sleep. He has already laid down for the evening. His children are in bed. His children are most likely sleeping or playing in the corner of the room with their Legos. Now, I just added that part in there. But, you know, that's how kids do. But his children are in the bed. And they are sleeping. And so you've got this man knocking on the door. And the man that is laying in the bed, he he's yells out or speaks out, Look, man, I'm in the bed. You know, my, even my kids are even in the bed. Uh, go somewhere. You know, I, I love you and everything, but I'm not going to get up. I'm already in the bed for the night. Some of you can identify with that. You ever had somebody that you know, they call you on the phone, and you're usually at the most inconvenient time, and you're like, no, not tonight. And so you, you may be hanging. And then they call back. 
It's usually whenever they've called three and four times, like, this must be important. I mean, I don't know what in the world at two o'clock in the morning can be so important. But this is what is happening to this man. His frustration begins to mount in this man. And so he cries out to him and lets him know that he's already in the bed. But the Bible said but because of this friend's importunity, he continues to rasp upon the door, begins to knock, knock, knock. And the man has already told him, in, in other words, look, I'm not getting up. Go somewhere. I love you, but go somewhere. It's too late for that right now. And his friend said, man, look, I've got to have three loaves of bread. I'm standing at the door because I've got a friend back at the house that's in bad shape, man. Look here. I'm going to stand. I'm going to keep on knocking. Look, dude, you got to get up, man. I got somebody in bad shape back home. We need you to get up. And finally, the Bible said, because of this man's importunity, in other words, his persistence, he rises up out of that bed and he goes to the door and he gives him the three loaves of bread that he is so desperately needing so that he can go back to his house and he can give his friend the bread that he needs to get him revived. You see, there's a lot of different symbolic things in this passage that I'll explain to you as we go. But if you think this this morning, first of all, this man is asking for three loaves of bread. That sounds like a lot of bread for one man's need. Can you say amen? So he's asking for three loaves of bread when on average a loaf of bread in their day could easily, just one loaf of bread could have been more than sufficient for one man for one day. But as I began to study this, and I may get ahead of myself right here, but I'll tie it in later. In their day, that, that by the Bible would show us that the number three in itself is a sign or symbolic of completeness. How many of you know that numbers in the Bible, they mean something? But the number three it means completeness somebody say completeness so the number three meant completeness uh, y'all thought I was joking about the splash zone I'm trying not to spit up here but anyway but it's, it represents the number of completeness how many of you remember that when Jesus died on the cross the Bible shows us that he was in the grave for how many days and you know whenever he was in the grave for three days the number of completeness shows uh, that after that third day that he had completed the act that he came to do what says conquer death hell and the grave not long after that he would rise up from the grave and we would see the completeness of salvation and I'm going to tell you this morning uh, that what this man was trying to do when he said three loaves of bread he wanted to make sure that his friend could not just get a little bit better but he wanted to make sure I don't have to come back later I don't have to come back in the two o'clock in the morning because my friends already ate a loaf and a half or two loaves but I want to make sure that I've got more than enough somebody say more than enough this morning but you see when you look at this story there is three important messages that Christ gave the church the first one is a message of intercession in that there are three people that I have explained to you the sick and traveling man the man that is going to be the middle man if you will he has become an intercessor and another friend who's got plenty of bread but he has already gone to bed but it's a message of intercession it means that somebody is going to stand in the gap for somebody else how many of you that are here this morning that are thankful that when you were in sin thankful that when you were out running the roads going 90 flying through stop signs and running the roads with your buddies and doing dumb things uh, that you had a mama that prayed for you a mama that cared about you that you had people that loved you enough that would try to encourage you down the right path. But it was a message of intercession. It is a message of persistence. It tells us that we're not supposed to just ask one time and ask lightly. But God would have us as a church to be persistent in what we do. How many of you know that as we have said for generations in America that the squeaky wheel gets the grease? In other words, the more that you began to knock, the more you began to ask, the the Bible has even told us that he asked the church or commanded the church to pray without ceasing. That means uh, that if you've got a need, if it gets desperate enough, you are going to pray and keep praying until you get that need met. I can tell you there's some mothers here this morning that if your child fell into a coma, that if you sat by that bedside, you wouldn't just pray one little lay me down to sleep prayer, mama, but you'd lay hands on that child and you began to 
to pray and you would pray with everything within you and if you had to pray five times tonight and 25 times tomorrow and 30 times the next day how many of your mama said I would do whatever it takes to see my baby get out of get out of that coma and get better but it's a message of persistence uh, in that the one that has no bread is willing to continue to knock on the door until the one that has bread is willing to get up and supply the need it is also a message of desperation in that the friend has also obviously traveled all day or all night long he's arrived in a beat down broken state of affairs and now he stands or he lays possibly in a manner that is his friend's house and this man is in such bad shape we cannot afford to wait six to eight hours until sunrise we cannot afford to wait until the sun comes up and the marketplace downtown opens up we cannot afford to wait until the baker opens up the bakery we have got to do something right now if I don't do something this man may die there are some of you mamas this morning that know exactly what I mean when I say there are some situations that involve our children that are so desperate uh, that it'll move you to do things you would not normally do. Can you say amen to that this morning? You see the very concept of desperation is uh, is that a situation of despair leads you to some extreme measures. You're willing to do things you would not normally do. You show me this morning somebody that's living in a situation where they're running out of food and they're about to be evicted from their home and they're in bad shape financially but yet they refuse to go out and look for a job. I'm going to tell you something folk. They ain't got desperate yet. Come on now. When you get desperate you're going to sell whatever you got to sell. My mama taught me that concept as a young boy. If we fell on hard times we should throw a yard sale and sell everything we had to make ends meet because when things get desperate, desperate need requires desperate measure to do whatever that it takes can somebody say man I've watched people in situations of desperation right here in this church a few years ago when a man died right there on the sidewalk outside of the fellowship hall, I watched Sister Richardson, a nurse who laid on, sat on top of that man that had died on the sidewalk and he was, or dying at the moment and she began to try and do CPR on him. Uh, she put her mouth on the strange lips uh, of a man uh, who had a checkered past and most everybody in the neighborhood knew it. Uh, but she put her lips directly on the mouth uh, of a man that she did not know and tried to do mouth to mouth on him. Uh, she, he even threw up, vomited uh, in her mouth. Uh, you say that's gross. Yeah, I know it is. Uh, but sometimes when you are desperate, uh, you will do things you might not know normally do because desperation requires uh, desperate means. Uh, I read a story years ago and it sounded like something barbaric uh, but I thought God what would I do in the same situation. They told a story of how that a plane crashed uh, in a remote area on the side of a mountain. It was covered with snow. It was freezing cold. Uh, nobody knew where this plane had went down. Everybody in that plane was in bad shape. Some of them had had broken legs uh, or broken limbs. Some of them were bleeding. Uh, they had made homemade uh, tourniquets trying to stop the blood from flowing. Uh, but after several days, uh, some of them that were in bad shape began to die. Some of them that had were in less worse shape, uh, they, they remained alive uh, but were in bad shape and they had no food. Uh, some of you may know where I'm going, uh, but after a while they began to talk amongst themselves. What in this world uh, are are we going to do? We've got no food. Uh, some of them were so bad they couldn't even go fight, try to find food. Uh, and after a while they began to ration within themselves. Something that if you'd asked them before would you ever think about? Oh, no, I would never in a million years do that. But they began to go to their dead friends uh, that laid in the snow that had died uh, and cut the flesh off their body and ate the flesh off of their friends uh, out of desperation. Now I know some of you are saying pastor that is off a graphic and I can't imagine and neither can I but can anyone agree that when you get in desperate situations uh, you may not you may do things you would say you would never do come on now in the Bible we 
we read in the Old Testament where the Bible shows us uh, there came a time when the, when the people went through such a famine uh, and such a place and a time uh, of drought uh, that they began to sell donkey heads uh, and dove's dung uh, for money. People were actually paying money for a dove's feces. Uh, they were actually paying money for the head of a donkey that has very little meat on it. Uh, some of you saying, Pastor, that's awful gross. Uh, you got it. I believe it and I agree with you. I don't. I can't imagine. You can look at me and I'll be the first to tell you if I was in the woods and I was lost, uh, I'd have to think a whole lot of times for I ever, amen, ate me some rattlesnake. I just, just some of you would be like, I would be, I'll take some and don't me in them no need. But not me. I just ain't in the mood for snake today. How about you? Some of you. But I can tell you I'd have to be desperate to grab me up some rattlesnake or some boa constrictor, slice it up and eat it. Not just me. I just turn my stomach thinking about it. But you would be desperate. Can you say amen to that? But I would have to ask us, could it be fair for us to say that when we see people in situations and they're not doing anything about the mess that is in their life or the problems that they have, is it fair to say that if they're not doing anything that it might not have got desperate enough just yet? Let me tell you, you and I have been called to be just like that friend that went to his friend's house. We are made, we are called to be intercessors. How many of you Christians in the house? How many of you are blood washed saints in the house? Do you know that not just mama's here today but daddy's, grandpa's, grandparents, uh, fathers, uh, um, brothers, sisters, friends, uh, God has called every one of us uh, to be intercessors on behalf uh, of those that we love. Uh, when we see somebody going down the wrong path, that we stand in the gap and we make up the hedge for those that are in need. Can you say amen? Sometimes as a parent, you don't like to do this, but how many of you know you can't? Sometimes you got to cut the cord. Hey, yeah. Uh, Sometimes you got to cut the cord as a parent. Now, this ain't real popular. I might not get a right lot of amens, but hallelujah anyway. But I've got one of my children, my daughter. And there was a time that, you know, well, Dad, we're, we got this problem. Dad, we got, Dad, we're in need for this and that. And I'm not, I'm not throwing off of my daughter. I love her to pieces. And I say the same thing as she was here. But, Dad, I got this problem, this thing going on, and that and the other. And so there's a little money here, a little money there, trying to help here, trying to help there. And after a while, I told my wife, I said, if we continue to do things the way we're doing, we're going to continue to enable the problem. And so it's best maybe to back off a little bit. And so we backed off just a little bit. And during that period of time, my daughter got to the place that she had asked a couple times, and we said, no. And we honestly God had allowed it to work out that way we really didn't have the money at the time so I, we, we don't have the money well if I'd have known now what I know then I, I, it's a good thing God worked it out the way he did but it was some months later uh, several months later that my daughter was sitting with my wife one day and she said mom I just want to thank you and dad for doing what you did and she said what is that that you, you told me no she said what do you mean by that she said well you know I was calling asking for this and that and she had long been out on her own and all that and she she said, but when you told me no, she said, it caused me to realize that I've got to start doing some different things to, to get what I need. And she said, there was a, a time, Mom, uh, that all we had was a can of black olives uh, and a can of carrots, sliced carrots. Uh, and she said, me and my husband and my daughter, we lived off of a can of sliced carrots and black olives uh, for an entire week. That's all we had. But you know what happens? Uh, desperation will move you. Desperation will cause you to do a little something else. Uh, my name how many of you say this morning that sometimes for some people things just ain't got desperate enough in the situation that they're in but there's things that God showed me about this story that I believe that we can gain something out of and the very first thing is that it's in, it's in midnight and it's an inconvenient time to get food do you know that sometimes that God allows us to get into midnight desperate midnight needs sometimes of our lives that God allows us to hit rock bottom. You're looking at somebody. I'm a very independent person. I wouldn't ask you for anything even if I need it in most situations. I'm just a very independent person. If I can figure it out, I will. But sometimes that gets me in a bad mess. There have been times in my life that I needed something and I'd sit down and I'd try to have myself a little mind powwow. Well, if I can just have a cup of coffee and a cake donut, we can figure this out. And I'll figure 
figure out how to pay that bill. I'll figure out how to fix this mess. But there have been times before that God said, I don't care how high your IQ is, Joe Myers. I don't care how good you are with your hands. I don't care how much you can think, how many people you got connections with. I'm going to let you get in some situations that you can't figure it out. You're going to have to rely on me. And when it gets desperate enough that you start calling out on God. You see, we've got family that have been wallowing in the mire of sin that have fallen flat on their face. We love them. We pray for them. Uh, but it has not got desperate enough. Uh, and I'll tell you, when you're in jail or you're standing in front of the judge and the judge says, uh, he's putting you in jail, all of a sudden it's got desperate. Uh, amen. One of our brothers right here in the church had testified to me. He said, Brother Myers, uh, he said, God used a situation to give me a wake-up call. Am I right, Brother Coon? Uh, he allowed God, allowed uh, that situation to get his attention. Amen. Our sound booth man, Dan the media man, uh, right back there in the back, my buddy, uh, he told me, he said, Brother Myers, uh, he, was, he used to deal drugs, uh, used to sell drugs from my understanding, uh, but one day after uh, some time he had, had a stroke or heart attack uh, and, and God allowed the family to go through something that hit rock bottom uh, and it was in that place of desperation uh, that he began to cry out to the rock of ages. Uh, it was in that situation uh, that he realized just how much that he needed God. Do you know the same thing happened to me? You want to know why that I preach the way I do? You say that guy's got more energy than all of us. Did he drink a Red Bull? No, it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost that makes me preach like this. I'll tell you, the reason that it's that way, the excitement uh, is if if God did in you what he did in me, you'd probably do the same thing. Some of you don't know where I was. Uh, Some of you didn't know me when I was a 15 year old boy laying in a boy home beating on a pillar saying God where are you I didn't even know who God was uh, hiding out in a tree after I'd done something stupid hiding out from the police uh, several things I could tell you hey man I felt like a major disappointment to my family went into Navy boot camp thought I was going to try to prove to everybody that I could do something got a few weeks into boot camp and then I had to come home because of a medical situation still feeling like a failure but do you know what God allowed to happen. I got to the place that that wife of mine we met when she was 13. I was 15. Most of you know that. We dated at a young age but I was in a place we'd been married. I told the story recently and I got to the place that I began to fall out of love with my high school sweetheart. God forbid. And I told her I don't want to be married to you anymore. I was in a mess. Somebody say amen. But as I got into that midnight need that desperation of a midnight need. I had a grandma that was praying for me. Had a wife that was praying for me. I was supposed to go to a job that night. I was a workaholic. I was supposed to make it to work. My grandma was praying. She told my wife, she said, we're going to pray that God will work it out for him to make it to that revival. Right there in Montverde, Florida or Ferndale Church of God. And so it just worked out. My boss called. I'd already told her, well, if I didn't have to work, honey, Some of you husbands, you know what I mean. If I didn't have to work, then I'd go to church tonight. Well, my boss called, and he said the job was canceled. I believe that God had a cancellation assignment already written in order. Come on now. But that night, it was August of 1997. It was night. It was my midnight hour. I've told some of you this before, and I'm ashamed to tell it, but I was on the verge of joining the KKK. I missed it by one phone call. I thank God God got that mess out of me. Come on now. But that night, uh, I went down to that church. I stood. I was right about three pews back on that side of the church. Uh, and that night, when God began to convict this boy's heart, I I thought to myself, God, if all these people can do it, then so can I. My grandma told me it was right. And my mama tried to tell me it was right for family. My wife trying to tell me it's right. And I thought to myself, man, I've done tried everything else. I'd lost my truck. I was about to lose my marriage. No one that's my kid might call somebody else daddy. And I thought to myself, it's a midnight need. It's a mess. I went down to 
that altar. I come on now, Sister Misty. I went to the altar and I began to pray, God, if you're really there, come on now. God, if you really love me, will you save this boy? You know what God had to do? He had to wash away a whole lot of mess in my life. Aren't you glad that when you come to God, God said, I don't care what you did. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how many drugs you've done. I don't care how many illicit affairs you've had. God said, I love you so much that in the time of a midnight desperation that I'll save you in spite of you. I can tell you this, this morning that not only is it a midnight inconvenient time to get food, it's obviously a right now need. There are some of our families that are in that very place and there are some that they haven't got there just yet. But I've watched them. They put their stock in everything else and trade their family for foolishness. I've told all of my kids the same thing. I said, I've been here by your side your whole life. Your mama's been by your side your whole life. I told my daughter, one of those little boys that she was running with, hey amen, a hoodlum, praise God. I said, anyhow, I said, look, you're going to trade that boy. You ain't known him for two weeks for a family that's been by your side your whole life. Come on now. Get right and get real. Amen. Let me tell you this morning. Why would you trade a God who's been with you since the foundation and the only reason you still have breath in your body? Life this morning is because of a God that loved you when you turned your back on him. A God that loved you in spite of you. Can you say amen this morning? But it is the intercessor that does not have what his friends need. You know, I began to think about this this morning. This intercessor, he's a lot like Peter and John. Hey Amen. Whenever the Bible said that this man laid at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. How many remembers that story? A man crippled, a man that was lame. He laid at the temple called Beautiful. And Peter and John came passing by one day. And that man held his little cup out for alms, uh, begging for money. Just a homeless man like, if you will. A man in bad shape. And Peter and John passed by. And when Peter looked down on him, uh, Peter could have reached in and pulled out the lint from his pockets. If he'd have had pockets, uh, he said, look, man, silver and gold have a none, but such as I have give I unto thee do you know the intercessor in this story says look I ain't got much here I don't have a whole lot but silver and gold have a nut but I got something else I can give you you know what he was saying I can't help you but I got a friend who's a baker I got a friend who can give us not three loaves he can give us everything we need I've got a friend that can give us a complete blessing and he says if you'll just give me time. I'll go to my friend. Some of you that are here this morning, you got sons and daughters, friends and co-workers and people that you love with all of your heart. Do you know that what God is calling you to do is when that sinner comes to you and they've traveled long and hard, they've laid in a lethargic, lamenting position at your doorstep and they need somebody who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge. They need somebody who will go to their friend I said they need somebody who will go to their friend. How many of you know that our God, he's a friend that sticks closer, closer than a brother. And I can see us down in the altar prayer, Sister Tracy. God, I've got a family member right now. I got a mom, I got a daddy, I got a cousin, I got a friend, I got a lady I work with. God, I'm asking you, they're in need of bread. They're dying. They're going through a mess. They're going through a divorce right now. God, I'm asking you to help my friend. Is there anybody that's willing to say, God, would you help my friend? God, I'll stand in that gap and make up the heads this morning. My God, I love him, don't you? But an intercessor does not have what his friend needs. When you've got a midnight need, let me tell you something. When you've got a midnight desperate need, you don't go to somebody as broke as you. Uh, if I need steak, I mean Raymond noodles, I ain't going to Cousin Fred's house and all he got is Raymond noodles. Come on now. If you're broke, you ain't going to somebody else broke. 
you don't let me preach to you. The Bible tells us that in our sinful nature, that all of our righteousness is nothing but, come on now. Son, go get me that trash can right outside the foyer door. Bring it to me. Trash and all. How many of you know that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags? Come on now. If I need not to one one, I want that big gray one outside the foyer. Outside, son. Outside. Attention to detail. But all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. Why would I go to somebody else who's just as broke and just as much in a mess as I am? Come on now. If I need something, I'm going to somebody who's got what I need. I thank God I passed by that thing and I thought to myself this morning, I wish somebody would empty that thing out. Look at that. Trash. Come on now. Somebody say trash. I want you to understand this morning that when God reached down into that trash can of life, he pulled out a sister Amanda Pettis, now Henry. He's pulled out some sister Myers. Uh, he's pulled out some Devin Myers. Uh, he's pulled out some Clay Pools. Uh, he's pulled out some Tracy Bernards. Uh, he's pulled us all. Lord God have mercy, pulled us all out of the same old nasty trash can. Amen. Ain't nobody here has got the right to brag that you are somebody. Come on now, everybody. You might look around and think, well, I never did that. Well, what about all the mess you did do? Well, I never cheated on my wife. Yeah, but you didn't tell nobody you cheated on your taxes five years in a row and nearly got arrested by the IRS. Come on now and get with that. Let me tell you something this morning. Our God loved us so much. He said, I didn't come for them that are whole. My God, I'm beginning to feel like preaching this morning. He said, I didn't come for them that are whole. I came for the people that need a physician. I, need, I came for the people that are sick. I came for the people that got problems in their life. I came for people that know they're a mess. I came for the people that know their life is all a mess. And he said, I'm going to pull you out of the same trash can. You've heard the names of greats, uh, people like Billy Graham, uh, or you've heard names like him and Charles Finney and great, great men of God from years gone by who lived a life and tried to serve God. Let me tell you, you came out of the same trash can as every one of them. God said, I didn't pick and choose. I didn't look in there and go, that's too nasty to touch because the blood covers it all. My God, I said, the blood covers it all. You said, Pastor, I took somebody's life. God forbid, I hate to hear that, but let me tell you, God saves a murderer. God saves the rapist. God saves a lesbian. God saves a drug dealer. God saves a dope dealer. God saves those who are in the filthiness of sin. God reaches down trash can of life and he pulls us out let me tell you that's the desperation of a midnight need somebody this morning that can say it's midnight it's midnight and I got some family that needs bread it's midnight I got a daughter I got some grandkids they need bread. Who's going to stand in that gap if you don't? Let me let you in on a little secret. Really not a secret, but it seems to be. Nobody is going to care about your family in most every case. Like, you can tell your coworker who you know goes to church and she tries to live right. Pray for my son. I'm going to tell you, she won't probably most cases pray like you will. Especially when it's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. Come on, am I telling the truth? Because when it gets desperate enough, you'll go to prayer. I've got to ask the church this morning, how many of us who have left off from praying because we've watched and it seemed like there's no change. They're not getting any closer today than they were when I was asking five years ago. But you remember what the Bible said? Because of his importunity. I've watched times when you've been in and you've been out. You've tried to serve the Lord and times when you weren't trying to serve the Lord. But you know something Amen. You got a mama and daddy that they call.
because of our importunity, we kept on praying. We kept on believing. You know, there have been times uh, that Sister Tracy, that we watch the enemy fight you, fight your mind, fight your family. But you got a pastor and pastor's wife who have laid on the floor when you didn't know it, uh, who have fasted when you didn't know it. And we've said, God, I've got a friend. Uh, God, I've got a friend uh, who don't need just one loaf of bread, uh, but they need three loaves of bread. Uh, I've got a family member. I've got a church member, and they're in need of bread. In the flesh, the enemy would rather you get mad at folk. Bless the Lord. Borrowed two hundred and eighty-three dollars and seventy-two cent from me. Still ain't paid me. Come on now, that's how the devil works. That's the devil. Do you care about people, or you care about material things? Let me tell you something. This might sound crazy as I don't know what. But I had a friend of mine, his name was Cecil Buchanan. I don't know why this came to me. Y'all be surprised the things that come to my mind when I'm in the middle of preaching. I'll tell you what, you'd either laugh, cry, or go to the altar one. Amen. But I got a friend of mine, his name is Cecil Buchanan. And Cecil Buchanan, he got desperate. When the midnight need gets desperate, you'll do things that you normally wouldn't do. And you can laugh at him or you can throw off on him. I thought it was crazy, but it worked. He told me, he said, Brother Myers, I know it's going to sound crazy. When people start out by telling you that, you're already in like, mm, no. He said, I got a brother that I have prayed for for years. I've been praying that God would save my brother for years. I would talk to him on the phone and witness to him about the Lord. And as soon as I bring the Lord up, he'll change the conversation. He got to go. Any other time, he'll talk your ears off. Must have been related to us. But he said, one night he called me. And he said, I got a, I got a bad situation. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, what's that? He said, man. He said, I got some bills coming due and he said, I got laid off from my job, and I've been looking. I can't find a job. He said, if I could just get one day's work, he said, I think I could make it. So I get this bill paid. He said, hmm, I got to thinking. He said, I told him, I want you to, I gave him an address. I want you to meet me here at this location at this time. And he said, I'll pay you $10 an hour. His brother's like, all right, man, sure. Reminds me of Amy. Anyway, it just happened to be the address of his church. And when he came in, his brother was all looking around. What are you trying to pull on me? He said, I told you I'll pay you. His brother just laughed at him. Well, he sat through the service, and his brother ended up getting saved. And to this day, my understanding is his brother's preaching the gospel, pastoring his own church. Let me tell you something. The reason why I told you that is just... I'm not telling anybody to pay nobody. That was a one-time unusual thing. Jesus took some dirt and put some spit in it and rubbed it in a man's eyes. I never read where he did that in a different way another time. He always would do things, unique things. I don't know. All I can tell you is a man got saved, and that's what really matters. But how much is seeing your family get the bread they need, how much is it worth to you? If you stop, oh, Lord, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble with somebody right here, but you're going to just have to pull up to the table and eat anyway. But you get mad at your family over the silliest, trivial things. Is their soul more important than the fact they did you wrong? Is their soul more important than the fact, or you rather cut them off because the way that they said something to you, or the fact that this or that or the other, none of that at the end of the day matters. Because when I die, when you die, you can write a check for a million dollars, but you can't cash it when you get on the other side of eternity. Come on now. You can put all your houses, your land, your boats, your cars, your ATVs, your jewelry, your gold, your 401K. You could put it all in the bank uh, and put it in your casket if you can fit it in there and do like Pharaoh. They say that over in Egypt that Pharaohs of old, that they had all this gold and I had all these things and possessions. And so what they would do is they would bury. They had a whole entire, it looked like giant mausoleums underground. And they would 
would bury these pharaohs. Pharaoh would be sitting in a gold chariot. This is crazy stuff, folks. You think we do crazy stuff. They were sitting in a gold chariot, and there would be people, there would be gold statues of soldiers all around, and their belief and their ideal was is that whenever Pharaoh came back to life on the other side of eternity, that he would have all this gold that he could take with him. How many of you know you can't take it with you? You could pile up money all the way to to the sky. You could pile it up as high as you could pile it up. But at the end of this race, the Bible said, what shall it profit a man that if he gained the whole world and he lose his own soul? I could teach my son how to uh, throw a perfect spiral. I could teach him how to throw a three-point shot if I could even do that. I could teach him how to drive. I could teach him how to do a lot of things. Uh, But the greatest legacy you can leave your family is how to love God because there ain't but one thing that's going to matter when you get on the other side of eternity and that's whether or not you got a relationship with the king of kings and lord of lords uh, am I right brother Eric uh, brother Eric told me said brother Myers uh, he said I run I thought I scrapped I, I'd hit people in the head with a bottle of Jack Daniels uh, he said I thought I was the baddest I want everybody to know don't mess with Eric Joyner he played in the bars did a lot of crazy stuff over the years uh, but he said the other day he said I wouldn't trade it for nothing in no words uh, what God's done in my life uh, it's worth it the only thing that we regret is that we did not do it sooner why does it seem like a lot of times it takes tragedy to get our attention you say God I'm too messy my life I got secrets I got secrets I got things I'm not proud of. Let me tell you about God. There ain't nothing in the trash can of life that his blood's not powerful enough to cleanse. He said in the book of Isaiah, though your sins be as scarlet, he said he will wash them white as snow. How many of you remember when I was preaching about the scarlet thread here a while back? That's why that thread's hanging in the window. But I came across something when I was studying that really got a hold of me. The thing about scarlet, the color scarlet, in the Bible days there were certain colors that you could dye something. The the more the dye stayed, if I can put it in just everyday redneck talk, the more the dye stayed in the garment, the more it held on to the fabric. The longer the color stayed in the fabric, the more valuable that the garment would be. That is the reason why colors like purple and colors like scarlet, which is a deep, 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 dark, dark red like that of lifeblood. And so when I read that, one of the things that really stood out to me is that the color scarlet does not come out of a garment very easily. If they'd have had Clorox in that day, it would have took a lot of Clorox to get the scarlet color out of a garment and turn it back white. Now, when I read that, I thought I was going to have myself an exciting shouting fit. You know why? Because the Bible Bible said, though your sins be as scarlet, my Lord, he said, I'll wash you white as snow. In other words, though your sins are like that, that don't wash out easy. (laughs) Though your sins be like that, that ain't going to come out easy. It may take a lot of bleach. It may take a lot of detergent. It might take a lot of labor. But God said all it took was one drop of my blood. And the book of Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, Jesus' blood's going to wash them white as snow. Is there anybody this morning that can say, Pastor, I am a beneficiary of the fact that all of my scarlet stains have been washed white. I thank God this morning that when I was in a time of my life that I had a desperate midnight need that somebody stood on my behalf. Most of you have heard some of my testimony. Maybe not all, but I can tell you, some of it's really funny. Some of it's really sad. But it's all really powerful when you look at the outcome. Some of you have heard how my wife prayed for me. She prayed for me when I wasn't faithful. She prayed for me when I cussed her out. 
She prayed for me when I ta- called her daddy on the phone and said, come get her. She prayed for me. She wanted to slap me, but she prayed for me. She probably, it might have been a time or two she did slap me. I don't remember. But she stood and interceded and kept praying for me. She got so desperate. Some of y'all have been in there. You've heard this one before. She got so desperate. Somebody say oil. Yeah. She went to the pastor and she told the pastor, I really want to see him get saved. Well, Sister Christy, get you some anointing oil. And you start anointing the house. And you start praying over stuff. Lord have mercy. She anointed everything. She smeared oil on everything. I got in my S10 one morning to head to work, put my foot on the brake, my foot slid clean off the brake pedal. I grabbed the steering wheel, and I couldn't hardly hold on to the steering wheel. I put it back in park, and I went in the house. I said, look, you're going crazy with all that stuff. You're going to end up killing me. She said, well, if you get saved, praise the Lord. I sat down one night. She fixed spaghetti. I'm not on the keto diet anymore. We done broke too many times, Sister Tammy. I've cheated too many times. So I can eat some spaghetti now. But I love spaghetti. But I don't like spaghetti with oil in my spaghetti. Nor do I like oil in my sweet tea. And I sat down at the dinner table. I took a bite. Man, that tastes funny. I grabbed my glass of tea and pulled it close to me, and it looked like somebody put 10W30 in the top of my tea. Floating in the top. Looked like, you know what I'm saying. I said, what's in my tea? Hmm. Playing dumb. Hmm. I said, pour that stuff out. Get me some more tea. I don't I didn't know it at the time, but she'd walk away, you devil. I'm not talking about me, but she might have called me a devil a few times. I don't know. One night, let me tell you how, just let me tell you how the grip of hell works. One night I was laying in the bed. My wife so kindly made sure she doused and saturated my side of the bed with oil. No, I didn't slide out of the bed. I laid down in that bed. I didn't know it was greased. I laid down on that side of the bed, and I slept on that side of the bed every night. I did. I laid there, and I tossed, and I turned, and I moved, and I couldn't go to sleep. I laid there for a while, her laying beside me. Finally, I nudged her. I said, get up. She said, what? Why? I said, I'm sleeping on your side of the bed tonight. She said, what? I said, yes, I can't get comfortable on this side of the bed. I didn't know that then. I know now. She got on her side of the bed, rolled over, and probably mumbled. I think she said, she said, you devil. But as much as it sounds hilarious, and as much as people say, that is coming to something, Sister Meyer did some crazy, crazy stuff, take a good hard look at me. See, anybody can say anything they want to, but when somebody gets desperate, let me tell you how much God will move. My wife, she prayed, God save him. God save his sorry hide. I mean, get him saved. Wash him clean. And then God saved me. Then he called me to preach, and one day I heard her say, God, I ask you to save him. I didn't ask you for all of this. Because whenever you go in your importunity in a midnight desperate need, God said, here, you need bread. Here's three loaves. I'm going to do a complete work. God ain't done.
specialize in bondo. God don't specialize in fixing a fender. God said, I'm going to give you a complete overhaul. You see, I might have the same social security number, but I can thank God right here as I stand before God, heaven and earth, uh, that God has washed my sins away and brought me into the fellowship of God. He signed my pardon. He signed my name with the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you haven't heard this before, so I'm going to tell it again for those of you that have not heard it so you can, can, you can ride home and laugh about Brother Myers. But I was doing some, am I been preaching too long? You didn't say nothing. I'm in trouble. I got to come on with it. I'm coming on with it. But I was, I had not long been saved. I don't know, maybe a couple years or something. And uh, working at, on a job, I was doing some ceiling work at the Mount Dora. I think it was a high school or middle school there. And not run, long, far from that flea market. Man, I'm a going to town. I'm putting some ceiling in, working on my stilts. And I seen something out of the corner of my eye, and I kind of turned and looked. And back whenever I was in high school, we had a janitor, and we called him Mario. Anybody ever remember Nintendo? With a do 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 do. You remember that? Doing doing doing. You remember that? So our janitor, he looked like Mario. So as kids, we always called him Mario. Well, Mario was still, well, I don't know what his name is. He was still working for the school board, apparently. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye, and I did a double take. He was walking full stride down there with his little short legs, and he seen me out of the corner of his eye, and he did a double take. And we both did the same thing at the same time. He looked up, and his eyes got real big. Ain't no telling how many things that he had to clean up after me. And he looked up and he said, I know you. I said, yeah, I know you too. I said, uh, before, uh, before you, uh, I said, uh, I've been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he just looked at me. He said, well, son, you went from one extreme to the next. Let me tell you something. When God does something in you, somebody say he'll do it right. He'll do it complete. But I wonder this morning how many of you that have prayed and prayed and prayed, but here lately you don't pray the way you used to. You've got family that are lethargic laying back at the house. You've got grandchildren. You've got children that are in a mess right now, but because they hurt your feelings, uh, because they've done you wrong, because they owe you something or some other reason, you've continued to just disfellowship, disconnect with them. Let me tell you, you might be the only person standing in the gap making up the heads. You may be the only one right now that they can count on to pray for them and go to your friend for bread. I wonder how many granddaddies this morning, how many mamas, how many grandmas uh, that'll say I got some family that need prayer this morning. I've watched them in the bed of sinfulness. I've watched them. Their life is headed down the wrong path. Do you know we have an epidemic in America of drugs. Uh, There are people that look like they never did drugs uh, but yet they're addicted to meth. Uh, They're addicted to crack. I don't say that to be hard or hurtful. I say that because we've got people that are addicted laying on the threshold of our house. And they are people we love. They're friends of ours. We've got to go to the one. If it be a midnight need and go to the one that's got bread. I'm going to try and close with this and I want you to understand. Sometimes it can feel invasive And it can feel frustrating when you get around people who claim to love God and be a Christian and and every time you turn around, how you been, Devin? Yeah, make short talking. Sure, it'd be good to see you in church this Sunday. Man, come on. You got to bring that up every time we talk. I'm just making it real. My kids are before, whenever they weren't doing right, He said, I'm looking for a daddy, not a preacher. I said, well, I'm your daddy, and I am a preacher. But here's the reality. I love to have a good time, just like everybody else. But let me ask you a very solemn question. If you knew 
you had a brother or a family member that was eat up with stage four cancer. And somebody came to you and said, in this little bottle right here, I hold the cure that just was released for stage four cancer. It'll kill any cancer. Don't tell me. You can't convince me that if you love your family, that you would not want to do everything in your power to get the remedy and the cure to that family. So though you may say, I get tired of hearing about it, you keep pushing God off, there'll come a day when you stand before the Lord in the day of judgment and you'll beg God for another opportunity to hear your mama, your daddy, your friend, or your cousin, or whoever tell you one more time, come on and serve the Lord. Come on to church with me. Come on and live for the Lord with me. Because I'm going to tell you, this life is short. It don't last very long. The Bible said, what is life? It is even but a vapor that appeareth for a little time. It's, you ever been in the kitchen whenever you're cooking and you watch the steam rise up out of the pot and no sooner that the steam goes up out of the pot that it disappears into the air and so it is with life. Uh, you may be young and you feel like you've got life by the tail and you got a whole life ahead of you but let me tell you when you start getting 40, 50, 60 years old and you get on the other side of that hill and you're coming down fast uh, you begin to realize man life ain't very long at all. I don't have very long. Will you trade? Will you trade the pleasures of this life, all the trinkets and all the foolishness of this life for the eternity, the peace of mind that you can lay your head on the pillow at night and know without a doubt that all is well. Brother John Henry, will you come to the piano please this morning? There's an old song that the saints used to sing years ago. And it says, It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. How many of you this morning can say, There's been a lot of nights that I've laid my head on the bed and I was fearful not knowing exactly where I stand with God. During the period of time that my wife had been praying for me, standing and interceding, Brother Roy, on my behalf, putting oil on everything. There were nights, I've told this before, there were nights that I would wake up with the most horrific dreams that anybody has ever had. And one of the, one of the themes that seemed to be in most every dream was the shortness of time. The shortness. How many of you know this morning that nobody, no man holds time? We cannot forward time. We cannot reverse time. We cannot stop time. Time no man owns. The shortness of time was the theme in most every dream. I had a dream one night. And in this dream coming of the Lord was at hand. Jesus, just like the Bible said, that he will come like a thief in the night. And as it was in the days of Noah, whenever the people continued to mock Noah for building that ark, and there came a day, the Bible said, that God shut the ark door. The water began to rise up around. And at about the time that the people started seeing the water, it had never rained before. Water had only come up from the ground. But this day, God let rain come from the sky. And as I can only imagine, as that water began to rise, that their tone of mockery changed. And I can see him pounding on the door. Noah, Noah, let us in. Noah, open that door and let us in. I don't know what Noah might have said or if he even said anything at all, but Noah could have easily said, I tried to tell you, I didn't shut the ark door. I can't open it. But that night, I was dreaming about the coming of the Lord being at hand. And I don't remember exactly what I was doing. But all of a sudden, how many of you remember how the Bible said that the trump of God will sound? In this dream, the trumpet began to sound. And the first thing that came to my mind you waited too late to pray. And in my dream, 
I dropped down on my knees and I started praying as if I could get it right right then. But it was too late. I woke up, my whole body drenched in sweat. And you know what God was trying to do? God knew that one day in 2019 that I'd be preaching on a Mother's Day to such a beautiful crowd. But to be able to do that, Sister Patricia, God had to get this boy's attention and let me know, you don't have forever, son. You're going to have to make up your mind to serve me and to serve me now. I want everyone that will to stand all across the house, if you will, this morning. I want you to take for just a minute. I know the kids are coming in, but please don't let that be a distraction to you this morning. I want you to take for just a minute right now. If you are a child of God and there is somebody that you love with all of your heart that means the world to you, And you know right now they're not ready to meet the Lord. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed across this church.